Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for joining us today. My, uh, my name is Bernice van Bronckhorst. I'm the, uh, the Global Director for Climate Change in the World Bank. And again, uh, thanks very much for taking the time wherever you are. It's been a very busy few days. Of course, we had Earth Day yesterday and the Biden summit is still, uh, still ongoing. So it's a very timely uh, moment for us to have this, uh, this discussion here this morning. So today's e virtual event is, um, is to launch the, um, the decarbonization of maritime transport reports, really focusing on how to enable a transition to, to zero carbon bunker fuels in the shipping industry and in particular the relevance of this transition for developing countries. Um, so let me start, first of all, by expressing our gratitude to our partners from the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, who have kindly offered to, uh, to make this event part of the exciting Singapore Maritime Week uh, 2021. So again, many events happening uh, at, this, uh, at this very, uh, very uh, important time. We will be recording today's event and it will be available for replay. So uh, please do share your thoughts with us on Twitter using the hashtag uh, zero carbon shipping. At the, uh, at the end of the panel discussion, we'll also have a question and, an and answer session. So if you would like to ask a question to any of our panelists, please type them into the comment box on the World Bank Live page and we'll try to get it into the discussion. And of course, um, any questions that we won't be able to get to, we are very happy to follow up uh, with, uh, with you after the event as well. For many of you, news about shipping and maritime transport is an everyday occurrence. But uh, for most of the rest of the world, it takes an event like the container ship, uh, the Ever Given, blocking the Suez Canal to sit up and take notice of this absolutely crucial but really often overlooked sector that carries about 80% of all commodities traded around the world. And against this context, developing and emerging economies play a particularly important role, accounting for more than 60% of global seaborne trade, 40% of vessel ownership, and 80% of vessel registration. At the same time, however, the shipping sector accounts for about 9 to 10% of transport-related GHG emission worldwide. So it's a, it's a large source for, for emissions. If the shipping sector were a country, it would place as the sixth largest emitter between Japan in fifth place and Germany in seventh, just to put it in context. And it is also a major contributor of air pollution around the world, predominantly burning heavy fuel oil, a common residual product in, uh, in refineries. So maritime transport has really come under increased pressure to lower and ultimately to eliminate its contributions to global GHG emissions. Decarbonization of shipping certainly does represent a challenge on many fronts, particularly the regulatory, technological and financial fronts. But it also presents an enormous business and development opportunity, including for developing and emerging economies. For example, building renewable energy supply chains will allow many more countries to become suppliers of future zero carbon shipping fuels. This process will make today's bunker fuel market both more sustainable and more inclusive. As a member of the Getting to Zero Coalition, the World Bank supports the decarbonization of the sector by supporting our clients across a range of actions, including not just building energy supply change, chains, but also instituting energy efficiency measures in ports and vessels and improving regulatory and compliance matters for zero carbon shipping. So I'm really especially proud to host this event today which is looking at how to support the decarbonization of maritime transport. And I'm really looking forward to a great discussion from this uh, very esteemed and high level panel and to sharing insights from two new reports that were published just last week that are looking at how to decarbonize maritime transport. So to kick off um, this morning's discussion, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Nigel Topping, who is the high level climate action champion for the UK COP26 presidency to open the event and to provide some personal remarks on how the UK would advance the zero carbon shipping agenda ahead of the COP26. So with that, over to you, Nigel. Thank you, Bernice. Um, great, great to join you and, and thanks to the World Bank Group and UMass for these two great reports. Um, I think as everybody knows, this is a really crucial year for climate action with COP26, the delayed COP26, being really the first test of the Paris Agreement. And of course, very much in the public eye, the need for governments to submit updated uh, national plans to show how they're gonna 
achieve their commitments, which were made in 2015 to, to up. And we saw make great progress on that yesterday with the US back in the game. I've been speaking to a lot of US colleagues who have who have, who have been working through the, the difficult years of non-engagement and are really delighted to be back. And it's great. It's great for everybody. Um, as, as, as some of you may not know that my role is, uh, is as one of the two climate champions is, is a mandate from the United Nations Climate Convention to work particularly with non-state actors, so businesses, investors, cities and regions. So I'll, I'll speak from that angle rather than I don't speak for the UK government, although although many of you will have seen that the UK government's latest commitment to 78% reduction by 2035 does now for the first time include um, maritime and, and aviation. So that's an interesting development, which I think is relevant here. Um, and, and our job really is to work with those non-state actors as the multilateral system calls them to, to demonstrate what's possible through um, ambition and action and therefore create more political space for re regulators to be more ambitious. And of course, we hope that, that creates a, a positive feedback loop. Um, and I think we are all learning how to do this better in terms of the radical collaboration, um, uh, you know, getting to zero coalition being a great example, Bernice, I think of that. Um, and what we're really working towards is for all sectors to demonstrate commitment, what we call the race to zero, but then actionable plans. This is not um, just about lofty commitments to 2045 or 2050. It's about what are we doing in the next five and 10 years to make sure that the Paris targets and what the science says is necessary, that 50% reduction by 2030 collectively is still in sight. Um, so we need two things very specifically from non-state actors and state actors commitments to Paris and again great progress yesterday and then the concrete short-term actions so that by 2025 and 2030 we're on track and it's great to see in these reports the clarity of that interim milestone that by 2030 we need to have five percent of zero emission fuels in international shipping and I think that becoming a interim breakthrough point as we've described it in race to zero that we all converge on along the whole value chain um, is going to be crucial. And, and of course, we'd expect short-term shipping to be electrifying faster than that. So that's just the, the, the international shipping goal. I, I also think that um, the reports make two other really, uh, well, three other really important contributions to clarifying the path forwards. Firstly, clarifying which fuels and methods of fuel production have the highest potential uh, to show the enormous potential for developing countries to shift to those fuels. I was recently in Kenya, very well endowed with geothermal and solar. And we were talking about, could Kenya become a 150% um, generator of clean power? Because of course it could um, export excess power in terms of clean power in the region and green hydrogen and ammonia um, that we'll be talking about in the report. Secondly, I think also importantly is pointing out a, a, a dead end that we must avoid, the dead end of wasting time on LNG investments. Um, which will um, delay, the, delay the transition and um, take capital away from investment in the most promising fuels of hydrogen uh, and green ammonia. And I have to say, you know, on, on, on Wednesday with Mark Carney, I launched the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. We have 160 asset owners, asset managers and banks with between them $70 trillion of assets, all committing to net zero. Um, they will very quickly realize that uh, investing in stranded LNG assets will not help them get there. So the finance community is looking to very quickly align its um, lending and investment um, in net zero pathways as well. I think the third important contribution is the summary for policymakers and industry, which outlines the key actions necessary. And really pleased to see that you know we work very hard to try and converge and uh, with the Marrakesh partnership and with, with the Getting to Zero Coalition and others, the climate action pathways, which we published as part of our contribution to the UN climate process. And there's very tight alignment, which is great to see. I think um, I often use the analogy of the mobile phone sector where we're all move, we're all familiar with the idea of moving to 4G, from 4G to 5G. Um, and that pre-competitively defined agreement of, of key technical milestones is one way in which we can move much faster together. I think it's also worth um, noting the many synergies between shipping and decarbonisation of other sectors. Green hydrogen, of course, is going to be key to uh, sectors like uh, steel and trucking and some of the high temperature heat processes in industry, um, as well as its role in the energy sector as a, uh, as a storage um, medium. And green and blue ammonia, um, allowing for significant decarbonisation in the fertiliser industry, um, which will be key to decarbonising the farming uh, sector. 
So it seems to me that we are clearly uh, 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 very rapidly moving to convergence on agreeing that a transition to zero is feasible within the scientific the required time frame of by 2050. All signs pointing to hydrogen and ammonia being the most promising fuels. Um, zero emission fuels being ready um, by 2024, ready to order by 2022. That, those dates seem to be coming forward every time. I, I'm, I'm not steeped in, in shipping, but Venice, as you say, so every time I, I, I dip in, the, 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 we seem to be getting more confident we can go faster. Um, and I think the rapid increase in green hydrogen commitments from both governments and private sector players is encouraging. Um, we have a large number of um, cargo owners in the race to zero, but we need to have more um, shipping owners. So far, only um, uh, only uh, only the only container shipping is is mess. So we need more players along the value chain, more commitments from ports and from fuel manufacturers, uh, so that we can drive that near term um, collaboration across industry and government to drive um, the, the 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 pace needed. Also worth remembering that the incremental cost of shipping will be a negligible cost to end customers. That work that the Energy Transition Commission did on the mission possible pathways, um, really helpful, I think. So finally, long term, we've got to have a level playing field. Um, and that, I think, is going to mean that uh, some sort of carbon levy or similar forcing mechanism. And there, the IMO role is going to be critical. Um, and I know the dis discussions at the um, MEPC in June on the proposals um, from the Marshall and Solomon I Islands will be I think an important opportunity for the IMO to indicate its commitment to playing an active role in the transition to net zero. I know that a lot of people are looking to the IMO to show that leadership and are skeptical at the moment because they feel they haven't seen it. So I would encourage all governments to make sure that your IMO delegations are sending a clear message on the need for rapidly increased ambition. We can't continue to have one set of ambition communicated through climate ministries and a separate one through transport ministries. So in conclusion, um, really applaud the work of the World Bank and UMass in clarifying the options and converging um, on shared pathways across the value chain and public and private um, and showing how this can contribute to a just transition with particularly transformative economic benefits for developing nations. It's up to industry and governments to act now but you're showing us the way and let's work toward together so that by COP26 we can be signaling a clear pathway and shared ambition momentum across the value chain public and private so that we're all in the race to zero which as we've often said is a race that we can only win if we're all in it together thank you Bernice. great thank you so much nigel and and, and th thank you very much in particular for pointing out <clears throat> excuse me the um really rapidly changing climate in the climate i'm sorry a different word but the, you know in the in the sort of financial sector space not very exciting how that is moving so rapidly and obviously super important in this particular sector as well, but also the point you just finished with, which is this, this absolute need for, uh, for a level playing field. You know? So um, again, thank you very much for, uh, for you and, your, and the UK's uh, really instrumental leadership in this moment. Uh, we're all looking forward to COP26 um, later in the year. Um, so with this, I would now like to hand over to the lead authors of the report, um, which, uh, which the World Bank developed with valuable expert support from uh, the University Maritime Advisory Service. So Dominic and Andrew, I'm uh, really looking forward to, uh, to sharing the, you know, looking forward to you sharing the report's main findings and key takeaways with us. So Dominic, I think you're going first, over to you. Uh, actually, it'll be me. Thank you, Bernice. Um, I'm sorry, and Andrew first. Okay. It's not a tr no trouble at all. Thank you, Bernice. And uh, hello, everyone. As Bernice mentioned earlier, global shipping recently had a problem in the Suez Canal. While this was a big challenge, fortunately, it was only temporary. For many decades, though, shipping has had another challenge, much larger in scale and more permanent, as it affects almost every one of the 90,000 or so vessels on the ocean. What are we talking about? We are talking about shipping's emissions. The emissions challenge stems from the predominant shipping fuel, commonly called heavy fuel oil. Heavy fuel oil is a fossil fuel, a high carbon, high sulfur, dense black substance, which is left over after the refinery has separated lighter fuels like gasoline, diesel, or kerosene from crude oil. If you saw it in front of you, you would probably describe it as being almost like tar. It is so thick and sticky that, if you, that you need to heat it up before you can pump it into a ship's engines. And when it is burned, it of course emits greenhouse gases and air pollutants. Today, we would like to show you one 
that addressing this challenge can be turned into major business and development opportunities for countries, both developed and developing ones, as they can become producers of a new generation of zero carbon fuels for shipping. Two, that in our opinion, ammonia and hydrogen are currently the most promising bunker fuels, meaning shipping fuels, that can serve as zero carbon alternatives to heavy fuel oil in the mid and long term. And three, that liquefied natural gas is likely to play a limited role in this decarbonization process as a fuel, but can have a more important role as an input to produce zero carbon bunker fuels as well. Shipping activity has been growing tremendously worldwide over these past decades, and so have the related greenhouse gas emissions. Without substantial action, carbon emissions from international shipping will keep increasing to as much as 130% of the 2008 levels. To counter that, the International Maritime Organization, or IMO, which makes the rules for international shipping, has committed to go the other way, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from ships by at least 50% by the year 2050, and to fully decarbonize the sector. That means bring emissions to zero as quickly as possible within this century. So how can that be achieved? Ships need to both become more, much more energy efficient and to start using a new generation of alternative fuels, the so-called zero carbon bunker fuels. These are fuels which emit zero or at most very low greenhouse gases across their entire life cycle. In our analysis, we looked at three main categories of zero carbon bunker fuels to see which has the best potential to replace heavy fuel oil for ships. There are biofuels, where biomass from plants or agricultural waste is transformed into fuels such as biomethane, bioethanol, or biomethanol. There are also hydrogen and ammonia, where green hydrogen is made from water using renewable electricity, or blue hydrogen is made from natural gas, where we capture the carbon and store it securely to keep it out of the atmosphere. Either kind of hydrogen can then be used as a fuel or further processed into ammonia. And there are synthetic carbon-based fuels, where we combine green or blue hydrogen in order to make, uh, with uh, carbon taken out of the atmosphere, in order to make man-made methane or methanol. We assess these three different um, fuel categories against a set of economic, environmental, technical, and safety criteria. And we found that green ammonia and green hydrogen are currently the most promising opt options to decarbonize shipping, mostly because they can be produced at very large scale, are likely to be most cost effective and offer enhanced flexibility. We don't rule out biofuels and synthetic carbon-based fuels, but the availability of large amounts of sustainable and affordable biomass appears much less certain. And we expect that synthetic carbon-based fuels will turn out to be more expensive than ammonia or hydrogen. To complete this picture of alternative fuels, we also looked at liquefied natural gas, LNG. LNG has undeniable air quality benefits over heavy fuel oil and offers a theoretical advantage of up to 30% less carbon emissions. However, LNG is basically methane. And methane is estimated to be a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So any release of LNG into the atmosphere along its life cycle from extraction to distribution to combustion can quickly diminish LNG's theoretical climate benefit. In our analysis of LNG as a shipping fuel, we took this risk into account and examined several potential roles for LNG in shipping to meet the Paris Agreement's temperature goals. First, we looked at a transitional role, where ships initially use fossil LNG, which will later be replaced by zero carbon bunker fuels that are fully compatible with fossil LNG. This means biomethane or synthetic methane. A transitional role would then allow existing LNG infrastructure to be reused with zero carbon bunker fuels. However, from our perspective, biomethane is unlikely to be available in the volumes needed, and synthetic methane will likely be more expensive than ammonia or hydrogen. 
So a transitional role for LNG is rather not likely. Second, we analyzed a temporary role where ships use fossil LNG until 2030 when it will be quickly superseded by zero carbon bunker fuels. Here, one of the problems is the uncertainty about the greenhouse gas benefits offered by LNG. At best, the large scale use of LNG in ships in our analysis will lead to emissions 8% lower than using heavy fuel oil. At worst, they could be as much as 9% higher. This range of greenhouse gas benefits or disbenefits combined with additional infrastructure costs of 10 to 17% more, the risk of stranded assets and the risk of locking ships with a lifetime of 20 to 25 years into another fossil fuel technology makes a temporary role for LNG also unlikely. Ultimately, this leads us to conclude that LNG as a fuel is most likely to play a limited role in shipping's decarbonization. We expect it will mainly be used in niche applications, like on specific routes where existing LNG, LNG terminals are available, or on specific types of vessels, like LNG carriers, ferries, or cruise ships. Having said this, natural gas may play a different and more important role as a feedstock to kick, uh, kickstart the commercial production of zero carbon bunker fuels. The production of green ammonia or green hydrogen will, will be dependent on the availability of low cost renewable electricity. This electricity may not be available in the beginning in sufficient quantity. So producing blue fuels from natural gas with carbon capture and storage could help address these initial capacity constraints and get the entire process started. So what does this mean for the bunker fuel market? With conventional shipping, countries needed to have significant oil reserves to produce bunker fuels like heavy fuel oil. With zero carbon shipping, they will need large renewable energy resources like solar or wind instead. Compared to oil, many more countries, including many developing countries have these renewable resources and also have a lot of shipping traffic. So they have tremendous potential to enter a much more inclusive market and to become the zero carbon fuel hubs of the future. Experts estimate that we will need at least one to $1.4 trillion or more from 2030 to 2050 to reduce shipping emissions by at least 50%. A little more, but not too much would, would be required for a 100% reduction over the same 20 years. It sounds like a lot, but global energy investments were about $1.8 trillion in 2018 alone. That suddenly sounds much more feasible, doesn't it? Why is all this exciting news for the World Bank and its client countries? Because decarbonizing shipping represents more than a $1 trillion opportunity for business and development and can benefit countries that have traditionally not been participants in the global bunker fuel market. In a final step of our analysis, we quantitatively assessed countries around the globe to get some idea which of them may be well positioned to produce zero carbon ammonia and hydrogen for the shipping industry. We used a combination of five key criteria, energy resources, shipping volumes, geographic location, regulatory framework, and the potential to reuse existing infrastructure. This map displays the results for the scenario where countries produce green ammonia for shipping. It shows that many developing countries can be found among those with high or promising potential. We then conducted more detailed case studies on Brazil, India, Malaysia, and Mauritius to quantify the potential and obtain very promising results there are also other development benefits to this decarbonization process that are worth considering. Beyond the climate benefits and the investment and export opportunities we've already mentioned, we also suggest that zero carbon bunker fuels will support developing countries in achieving their wider energy transition more flexibly and at a lower cost. This relates, for instance, to the decarbonization of their power grids, as well as the modernization of their overall infrastructure. In summary, what can policymakers and industry do to take advantage of these major opportunities? First, we suggest countries can make strategic policies to drive this energy transition, 
Internationally, this includes, for instance, the introduction of a meaningful carbon price on bunker fuels. Nationally and regionally, governments can develop industrial hydrogen strategies or provide financial support to pilot and dem demonstrator projects. Second, we recommend policymakers always consider emissions across the full greenhouse gas life cycle of any low or zero carbon fuel. In that light, and given the other risks identified in our reports, new public policy in support of LNG as a bunker fuel should be avoided, existing policy support should be reconsidered, and methane emissions should be regulated. Third, while more and more industry stakeholders are becoming increasingly vocal about their favored zero carbon shipping solutions, we urge business to also implement so-called no regret options. These include increased energy efficiency and maximum fuel flexibility and will ultimately benefit any kind of future bunker fuels. Finally, we encourage all industry stakeholders to actively join the policy discussion. Their constructive support will help increase certainty on the availability, pricing and timing of zero carbon bunker fuels, not only to their own benefit, but that of the entire sector. In short, we are heading to new shores here and clearly need all hands on deck. Thank you, Dominic and, and Andrew, and, and, and trust Dominic to end with some nice maritime, um, 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 how do you say, um, examples um, in, in, uh, in his presentation. But again, thanks very much for these really, really interesting findings. And, um, and, and I think the last point that we really encourage really everyone to participate in this discussion is, uh, is, is really important. And of course, um, that's what we are going to be doing the rest uh, of this session. So um, just to let everyone know, we're posting the link to the three reports in the comment box of the World Bank Live page. Um, and I really, really encourage everyone to go and read and, and, and share, you know, these really, really excellent uh, knowledge resources. So um, with that, I would like to turn now to our first panel to discuss how zero carbon shipping can offer opportunities for wider energy development for developing and emerging economies. So really looking at what are the policy interventions needed to enable a zero carbon bunker fuel transition as well as spur a, a greater economy-wide uh, decarbonization. And what are the challenges preventing such an enabling environment? And, and, and what can we do um, um, to overcome some of these challenges? So to provide us with a view from um, both a global and national level, we are joined by three esteemed panelists. So very, very pleased to welcome um, Isabelle Durand, who's the Acting Secretary General of the UN Conference on Trade and Development, uh, otherwise known as UNCTAD. Um, we are also um, joined by uh, Mohamed Ahmed, who is the um, Director for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency from uh, Morocco, and by, uh, by Max Correa, who's the head of the New Energy Division at the Chilean Ministry of Energy. So, Ms. Durand, let me, uh, let me start with you. The reports find that decarbonization of shipping offers major development opportunities for developing countries. And as maritime transport plays such an important role for these countries, how can intergovernmental organizations like UNCTAD, um, the IMO and the World Bank, um, and many others, of course, help these countries to support shipping's energy transition and at the same time maximize their own development benefits? You are on mute, uh, Isabel. It's okay. I'm no, I'm no longer. Good. So uh, thank you, Bernice, for for inviting me, and uh, thank you to the, well, the to the World Bank for the presentation of this very interesting report. And I first of all would like to to highlight what is really the mandate of UNCTAD. So we are the trade for development body of the UN system, and we are especially dedicated to the developing countries, emerging economy. And I just would like to highlight what everybody knows in this room. It's all those economies where really severely highly affected by the socioeconomic consequences of the COVID-19 issues related to restriction of export, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a situation which, which, what, which we have to take into account in our discussion, because if we speak about, as it was said, about, for instance, uh, 
production zero carbon bunker uh, bunker fuel it's re it requires investment and we know all the forecast on investment foreign investment in developing country are bad uh, and all is decreasing and and the perspective on short term is not good so we have to have that in mind um, so I warmly welcome this this report uh, and the first condition that uh, was highlighted by Dominique Engler is related to the carbon price and it's true that we are really advocating for uh, international carbon price agreement and uh, as such it's an agreement which will not be easy to achieve we know so so that in the in the multilateral system today it's not easy to have this kind of agreement which have a so huge impact even if of course in all the conference everybody agrees but it's not because we agreed in the in the discussion that it will be easy to have this kind of agreement nevertheless of course uh, we are really advocating for that everywhere uh, and also with our member states and especially developing countries or emerging economies I can understand that they are sometimes a little bit reluctant because they are the less the 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 the, the less affected uh, less uh, uh, emitters, but also the most affected by climate change. So for them, it's not easy to go to jump in the in the discussion uh, as maybe other countries first. Secondly, it's true that decarbonization of shipping will have long-term positive impact for developing countries for sure. Um, however. Uh, on short term and in the coming years, the decarbonization uh, and the concrete measure uh, taking to reduce CO2 emission for shipping could result in higher uh, transport costs and lower connectivity, especially for some developing countries. And I think it's in particular to SITS, the, the small island countries, developing countries, or LDC, the, the, the last developed countries, which already face higher costs from transportation and all what I just mentioned with the socioeconomic consequences from the, the COVID-19. So it's true that uh, it's really crucial that careful attention uh, could be given to ensure that decarbonization efforts in shipping strike the right balance and trade-offs between the economic, social, and environmental dimension of sustainable development. That's of course, key. So as the role of the international organization, UNCTAD and the others, undoubtedly its uh, vulnerable economy need support in any case. And it's why we are trying to help and to support the, those countries, especially SITs and LDCs, which could be more affected uh, by increasing cost and lower speeds resulting from the short-term uh, greenhouse gas reduction measures. But also um, we have to, to work in order to show that uh, the most negatively affected by climate change are not those who will pay a second time. I think that's something that we have to have in mind. And sometimes it's not exactly the same discussion. It is the same in the WTO uh, between the different groups. So um, it's why UNCTAD is collaborating with IMO or impact assessment or measure aimed to decarbonize, decarbonizing maritime transport. We offer in UNCTAD a toolkit on sustainable and resilient freight transport. And we have a dedicated port management program in order to help the countries also through the port management. And in addition, we have a dedicated static, statistical database and uh, 230 national maritime country profiles. That's also something which is useful for, for the, the global uh, discussion. So my conclusion at that, at that level is really, we have to support and, and, and address the needs of the most vulnerable economies. Otherwise they will not play the game or they would not be able to play the game if they would like to do it. And it's why we have really to have a, a, a big attention to that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Isabel, uh, for uh, you know absolutely, and 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 I think your the point you're making about absolutely you know supporting the LDCs and the SIDS in particular, uh, you know very very um, very much um, close to our heart at the World Bank as well. Um, let me um, now turn to Mr. Ahmed um, of the of the, the government of Morocco. Um, how do you see alternative fuels as a game changer in terms of allowing more countries access to the bunker fuel market? Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much uh, to invite Morocco to this uh, important uh, panel. And uh, I, I, I will thank the World Bank to this uh, presentation of this uh, report. And first of all, uh, I apologize uh, on behalf of the minister 
who will not be able to attend this important event following professional commitment uh, of the last minute. And I will speak on behalf of the minister to present uh, the main acts uh, of Morocco to encourage uh, uh, development of uh, economic uh, low uh, carbon. Uh, as you know, uh, energy is, is uh, energy, the energy sector uh, is responsible for more than two, two thirds of global greenhouse gas emission and um, must be, uh, therefore be at the center of all effort to limit global warming. Uh, transport uh, accounts uh, for about a quarter of global energy related carbon emission. This contribution is growing faster in transport uh, than in uh, any other energy and uses sector without sustainable policy intervention, carbon emission directly from transport called double by uh, 2050. Uh, Morocco adopt in uh, adopt uh, the framework uh, of the National Charter of the Environment and Sustainable Development and by uh, a significant number of both regulatory and institutional reform. Ambitious strategy have been developed in priority sector uh, like uh, transport. Uh, in parallel with the ratification of the Paris Agreement, Morocco submitted its national determined contribution to the Secretary of the Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, 42 reduction of green uh, uh, of emission compared to project emission for the for the year 2030. Our sector energy is marked by a sustainable increase in energy demand, and Morocco adopt an energy strategy based is based essentially to increase the renewable energy, the development and the development of e of efficiency. In Morocco, the breakdown of national energy consumption shows that transport is the most energy intensive sector. It accounts for 38 of the country's total consumption. Several measures to reduce, to reduce consumption are already being implemented in Morocco. And especially Morocco, uh, in, 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 the, in the maritime transport sector, Morocco has 30,500 uh, kilometers of coastlines. 98 of the external trade is by sea. Maritime transport is the main support of foreign trade and a strategic vector of the Moroccan economy. Its control contributes to the stability of the national economy and, contr and contribute to the development of foreign trade. Therefore, maritime transport has always been one of the fundamental pillars of the, the socio-economic development strategy of our country. Hydrogen will be the key element in the transformation of a low carbon energy system. In many countries, it will accompany the use of renewable energy. The power to X will enable Morocco in the medium term to decarbonize the industrial sector, in particular the phosphate fertilizer industry, by, ad by ad uh, ad uh, avoiding the import of 2 million tons of ammonia in the long term. In the, in the medium and long term, power to x will make it possible to decarbonize our transport sector, ground and maritime logistics, aeronautics, throughout the two green hydrogen and methanol compounds. In addition, Mor Morocco could develop the production of green fuels such as diesel and kerosene. The study economic opportunity of power to x in Morocco that is uh, realized in 2019 has showed that Morocco could capture up uh, uh, 400 of the global demand into power to X. Hydrogen can be produced by renewable energy that Morocco have a huge potential. A combination of solar and wind power can provide a high load factor for the electronic, for the electrolysis process, allowing a, a, a competitive cost of green hydrogen. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uhmed. Um, Mr. Correa, Chile has been at the forefront of the drive for the transition to renewable energy in Latin America. Um, could you tell us how the production of zero carbon shipping fuels fits into Chile's uh, climate and energy goals? Sure. 
Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Bernice. And I want to also thank the, the, the World Bank, not only for this invitation, but for the whole uh, cooperation they've been giving us to us to, to, to design the strategy, our national hygiene strategy, to implement the, the, the hygiene strategy. So we are very uh, grateful. Also, I want to uh, greet Isabel and, and Mohamed. My, my, uh, so going to, to your question, um, the production of zero carbon shipping fuels derived from green hydrogen, such as ammonia, methanol, synthetic fuels, will provide us with a new source of potential demand for living green hydrogen. This demand will add on top of the hydrogen demand for domestic ap applications just mining, heavy duty transport, and blending in gas grids, leveraging a greater scale in production and thus reducing production costs. And since cost, since cost is one of the key barriers holding back the potential of green hydrogen, this scale up will allow green hydrogen and derivatives to be more deeply integrated into our domestic applications, creating a virtuous cycle of scale up and cost reduction. Additionally, Decarbonizing shipping is becoming a key element in, in increasing the competitiveness of our exports in a low carbon global economy. And our country, as you may know, is strongly founded in the export industries such as mining, paper and pulp, and, agri and agricultural products. So any reduction in scope three emissions that clean shipping achieves will increase the value of, of our products in, in a decarbonized world. Chile will be able to leverage its domestic green hydrogen decarbonization process in this sector. So if on top of this, technology, regulation, and markets all continue their route to a low carbon future in the shipping sector, then our economy will be, provide, will be a provider of fully green copper, green lithium, and other key elements needed for the global energy transition. Furthermore, if the scope three emissions become a key difference in the future low carbon commodity markets of the future, countries as Chile can even foresee the development of new industries, such as green steel, for example, to supply the world with clean materials for a sustainable economy. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Max. So if I can just immediately follow up with another question. Um, historically, Chile has not been one of the major bunkering hubs around the globe, but um, as we just heard earlier from Dominic and Andrew, this market may really align itself to sectors move to zero carbon fuels. So, so to what extent does Chile plan to leverage domestic demand and international demand to becoming a world leader in green hydrogen production? And, and what is your expected timeline for that? Sure. So first, that is, we have to, we are, you have to be aware that Chile has a great renewable resources. And also we have a great uh, suitable investment environment for clean energy. So our studies and, and different studies and our own estimations find that the most competitive green hydrogen, ammonia and methanol will be able to be produ produced here. Just to give you a concrete figure, our onshore capacities factors in Magallanes region, in the south of the country, can reach up to 70%. That's even higher than the great, than the strongest wind sites in, in, in the North Seas in Europe. So that means that our country has an opportunity to become a supplier of competitive clean fuels for sectors such as, such as shipping all over the region and the world. We are aware that we, we are a faraway country, right? We are nested so far that our land touches the Antarctic. But, we, but we, what, what we lack in position relative to our to global shipping routes, we will, we will more than make up in competitiveness of our clean fuels. Our recently signed uh, MOUs with Singapore and the port of Rotterdam, as well as our constant cooperation with Germany, are concrete actions that will pave the way to those exports. Uh, we just launched a 50 million US dollars funding round a few days ago 
to subsidize green hydrogen production projects in Chile. And that is a reflection of our commitment to clean energy transition. Um, additionally, we are open, openness to trade our strong infrastructure and our position between the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans are all features that reflect our great position to become integrated in these future clean bunkering supply chains. And as for timelines, our hydrogen strategy established that for the second half of this decade, the time when large scale green ammonia export will take off. So this year it has been proved that our strategy has been proven to be to be very much aligned with the, with what the private sector is expecting. We have seen several clean shipping projects all around the world announced to begin operating in 2025, a date which uh, coincides with the date in which the first large scale export project is being being developed being developed in Chile. Uh, is planning to uh, start their operations. The first of these projects, the Haru Oni project, will begin producing and exporting green methanol and green gasoline to Germany next year in 2022. Um, so we have already embarked on this journey and, and we believe it will take us on a, on a clear, cleaner economy to a more sustainable future. Great, thank you. Thank you, Max. It's really interesting to hear about uh, the Chilean plans. In the interest of time, because we are um, we are running already a little bit late and we have a really interesting panel to come still. Um, I'm going to pose the last question to you, Isabel. Um, in your view, what policy changes will be the most helpful at the international level to, uh, to uh, support the effort to decarbonize shipping and establish zero carbon fuels uh, as the new industry standards? What should we be focusing on? You're on mute, Isabel. I, I lose time. <laughs> so no, it's just a uh, carbon price is of course a key issue that we have to, and just I mentioned, it's not an easy issue, but we have all to advocate for that. And I think that when you look at multilateralism in danger and all those discussion, this kind of agreement could be really a proof uh, and maybe the shipping sector is able to do that. I'm a former minister of transport and I know that it's a sector which is really with big alliances, uh, even if they are biggest and, and small, et cetera, and competi competition. Nevertheless, I think that's, well, that's the key issue. Second issue is really uh, uh, to, to work on all the other market-based market uh, measure that we can really adopt on international level. Because in addition to uh, what Max Correa said about all the force uh, on national level uh, with resources for new uh, new fuels with uh, all the investment and the, the potentialities we need international agreement uh, it's not enough uh, of course all country has to start somewhere and it's a way to also impulse things in other countries nevertheless i think that on international level we have to do a lot in order to ever more or less uh, uh, level playing field uh, re regarding the price. It's really in a market, the, 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 the more significant uh, uh, issue and the polluter uh, system, the, the polluter has to pay. That's the rule. But it means also that we have, as I, I just mentioned, helped the, the developing countries with low resources to be able to not to be the victims uh, of this, this system. So polluters are, have to pay. Uh, developing countries have, be to, uh, have to be uh, supported and an international agreement on carbon price or carbon levy is something which is absolutely key. And I hope that in the, in the, in the COP uh, in, in December, we could maybe go a little bit further in this regard and show the, at least the will to go to this kind of agreement. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all, uh, all our three panelists for this first panel. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, stay for, uh, for the question and answer session at the end as well. Um, so moving on to our second discuss discussion this morning and, and taking on board what we've just heard, um, we would like to now focus on how the, um, the shipping industry stakeholders can, can plan for the sector's energy transitions and really 
um, hear what they're thinking about uh, what their role um, in moving this forward is. So to share their insights, we have leading experts um, joining us today. Uh, first of all, we have Birgitte, Birgitte Vardal, who is the Executive Vice President, European Wind and Solar Statcraft, and then uh, and, and former CEO of Golden Ocean. We have um, Christian Sazar, who's the Projects and Fleet Director at uh, Ultranav. And we have Tristan Smith, who is a lecturer at University College London and author of the third and fourth IMO GHG studies. So if I may, uh, Ms. Vertal, um, I start with you. You having been a former CEO of a shipping company and now developing a renewable energy investment portfolio, you know both sides very well, the shipping and the energy one. So from your personal perspective, what does it need to mobilize private investors for the production of zero carbon bunker fuels? Thank you for the invitation to join and, and I will come to your question. I just wanted to introduce that Startcraft is Europe's largest producer of renewable power. And we are actually quite active in Chile as well, uh, producing hydropower, wind, and also looking at solar. Uh, and we have recently announced a cooperation with Yara, the fertilizer producer and Aker, where we will try to greenify Yara's ammonia production in Norway, which is currently producing around 400 to 500,000 ton of ammonia per year. So it's really a large scale effort to transist from fossil ammonia production to green ammonia production. So we are preparing the fuel uh, for the industry. Uh, and we see together that there are many initiatives across the sector, sort of from the from the fuel producer <clears throat> to the engine manufacturers and the ship owners. I think what we see as important right now to be willing to invest into this is <clears throat> that we find the whole value chain at the value chain works. Uh, of course, uh, there need to be fuel available, uh, but there need to be engines and, and ships that work and we need to have the whole logistics around it. So building the whole value chain in the beginning. Then uh, in order for people to be willing to invest, we also need to see the revenue stream here and either to see some secure revenue stream uh, or that we see as have been pointed to increased carbon prices, which will defend this transition because it will be costly in the start uh, until you get the transition point where costs are going down. We have seen in wind and solar that the costs have dropped by 70 and 90% over a period. And you will see the same with electrolysis, et cetera, reducing the cost over time. But in the beginning, it will be costly. Uh, and then uh, the shipping industry, if they have the same level playing field, they have regulations that they can act on, then it's possible to have this transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Birgitte. So next, uh, Mr. Trezar, from your perspective as a ship operator uh, with a large fleet in many developing countries, what opportunities do shipping companies uh, stand to gain from by participating in the energy transition? And what are the policy incentives that would encourage a quick adoption of zero carbon fuels? Or, or in really in very simple terms, why is Ultranav proactively supporting shipping's decarbonization efforts? Well, Bernice, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation to participate. Uh, thank you to Dominic and to Andrew and the team at the World Bank. And as you know, we are always pleased to partner up and cooperate on, on forums and platforms that uh, promote the decarbonization in shipping. Uh, I think that the, 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 the question that, that you raise is important and uh, it's interesting from the point of view that uh, why we are actively participating in supporting this. And, uh, I would look at that question uh, basically from, uh, from two different angles. Uh, first of all, as we heard, uh, shipping industry is a relevant contributor to, to global CO2 emissions. And as a company, uh, basically we are committed to playing an active role in exceeding the current mandatory uh, reduction targets. Uh, we agree to, to Nigel's and uh, the statements that have been uh, said here in relation to possibly uh, increase the, the ambition at the IMO level in, in, in that regard. 
And we believe that there is a, our responsibility towards uh, the environment, the society, uh, including our customers, our employees, and uh, our communities. So that's one angle. And, uh, and the other angle is, of course, as you mentioned, our presence in uh, South America and, uh, and uh, developing countries from that point of view uh, also gives us the opportunity to participate in this uh, logistic chain and, and form a, an active part of what is going to be basically a cluster uh, around the production of uh, zero carbon fuels. So basically that includes investment opportunities in ships and technologies that will contribute to decarbonization and shipping, but also on the transportation of those uh, fuels uh, that will need to be distributed to bunkering uh, hubs around the world. We are already today active in uh, transportation of uh, ammonia and that will continue to be a, a significant part of our, of our uh, aim in the future. Thank you very much. So let me now turn to, uh, to Mr. Smith. Um, so you are one of the co-authors of the technical volumes and, uh, and also, of course, a co-author of the third and fourth IMO GHG studies. Um, these reports conclude that, the, that due to methane leakage, amongst others, LNG is likely to play a really limited role only in decarbonizing shipping consistent with the Paris Agreement temperature goals. So advocates of LNG are, as, as, as a promising lower carbon uh, bunker fuel, argue that these methane leakages can be minimized with future technological improvements. Would this bring LNG back into shipping's future energy mix? Thank you and uh, for the question and thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this piece of work and, and for World Bank thinking this through so carefully. It's such an important topic. Um, can I start by highlighting just how far away we are from the point of methane leakage being under control. As of ships ordered on the 1st of January, uh, from the 1st of January 2020, ships that could be at sea in 2050, there are about 250 new buildings that are notated LNG capable, which means different things, but um, only 33 of those ships have low methane slip engines. So in spite of all this prominence, which has been there for some time with the issue of methane slip, the vast majority of new built ships, are using high methane slip machinery. Um, on land, we still have very significant emissions, methane emissions coming from much of the production. Many countries have some estimate of that, but it's it's by no means under control. So it's, it's certainly possible that technology can solve this problem, but we aren't investing in that technology today. We do not have the regulation to drive it. But to answer the question, no, fixing these methane leaks does not bring LNG back as a credible option. And the arguments are worked through in the paper for against a significant role for LNG as marine fuel, not just on LCA, but on a much broader vision. And I think that Dominic has already done a good job of, of outlining that. So I'll try and be very brief and highlighting the key points that make that case for me. They bring a uh, the papers try to bring a much wider view, considering a sector with long life assets undergoing a complex system transition away from fossil fuels generally. A transition that I think can surely be in no doubt will move at very high speed, given the ever increasing flow of commitments made even this week, not least President Biden's commitment to push IMO to zero emissions by 2050, which which does change the calculus again as to what the lifetime of LNG really is it shortens it even further. The paper um, works through the additional capital needed for a temporary phase of LNG use, the range of environmental returns on that capital, including a very low methane leak future, such as the one you allude to, and the issue of, of asset values, the risks of assets with very short lifespans and the environmental consequences of technology lock-in. And only by looking across all of those issues and weighing up the, all the potential upsides with, uh, with, a, with the potential downsides, does it then try to reach a balanced view? So I think what we can say from that is basically that when vested, vested interests in LNG focus on its potential to reduce by up to 20%, they are misleading us in two different ways. The first way they mislead is because they're trying to get us to focus on the rose-tinted future potential and suppressing the much less flattering reality 
of today's high emission, high methane emission world, which of course destroys the justification to switch to LNG for greenhouse gas emission savings now, which is normally the next step in their rhetoric. The other misleading component is that they're oversimplifying the fact that this is a complex system transition away from fossil fuels, not just about jumping on anything that has a claimed advantage over current technology, even if that claimed advantage might be very small or arguably even negative. And we need to approach this by understanding what is best for the assets mix if it is to go through that transition in the interests of all the corporates that are in the sector, but also the governments that may be putting public funding into the sector's transition. Great, thank you. Thank you, Tristan. Um, if I may return to you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Vertel, a, a very, very uh, sort of practical question. Um, you know, while some shipping companies are becoming more and more vocal about their plans for the use and production of zero carbon bunker fuels, Others sort of appear to sit and wait for more certainty. So you start seeing that, that change, um, that division. So what are the specific challenges that the first movers um, are currently facing? And, and how could they be overcome? How could we support um, the first movers in this area? Uh, <clears throat> for, a, for a ship owner investing, it's of course, several items. It goes around uh, technology risk. So what is the right fuel for the future? Uh, the engines are yet under testing, etc. some of them. Uh, so sort of what do you choose? Uh, also, you know that you will have a higher cost as, as a first mover. Uh, so we need to make sure that we are able to, to compensate some of those costs uh, to compensate for the sort of first mover disadvantage. Um, secondly, there is some flexibility in the type of engine. So if you are able to, to choose a, a flexible engine uh, with the combination of a fuel that you can use today and, and in the future. Uh, you can also have uh, governments uh, putting requirements uh, on procurement. For instance, in Norway, there is a legislation that all new ferries from 2023 has to have a zero emission fuel. So then you put everyone on the same uh, level playing field, which I think is, is really important. And then you are competing against others that has to compete on zero emission fuels. So that's a very good way to drive this going forward, I think. Thank you. Again, practical question, very practical answers. Um, Mr. Sajar, can you share with us to what extent existing conventional and future zero carbon bunker fuels will differ in their costs um, and, and how can this competitiveness gap be closed uh, effectively? That is a very good question, uh, Bernice. Uh, and actually also a difficult one to answer because uh, basically today there is virtually no or very little uh, zero carbon bunker fuel in the market. So in reality, this is not really my field of expertise and uh, Tristan Smith would probably have a much better answer to the actual cost difference as such. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, the cost difference is expected to be very significant and uh, particularly until we are in a position to scale up uh, the production and uh, that was also mentioned by by Max uh, and, uh, and until the industry is in a position to replace those 250 to 300 million metric tons that are required to to replace uh, current uh, uh, carbon fuels in the in the shipping market, so I think that basically the the main element that or one of the main elements that will play a role in that uh, is the the cost of renewable electricity, uh, which will depend on the development of all those projects, uh, and also the the cost uh, of of carbon solutions, which uh, are still uh, under development basically. How the development how the competitiveness gap can be closed. Um, we believe that the market in, it, in itself uh, will not be, in the beginning at least, uh, will not be able to solve this issue alone. That is why uh, policies and regulations are, will become very, in, very important. And uh, in that respect, it has been also variously mentioned here that, uh, and this is also what we are looking for in terms of, uh, as a ship owner, is that we promote a fair and uh, framework, which is a level playing field for, uh, for everybody. Uh, we would like to see the IMO being uh, the, the, the one that promotes these solutions on a global basis, but we also recognize that uh, there are uh, regions in which uh, some solutions will also uh, be implemented uh, beforehand. 
and the momentum is there with the European Union and the US and uh, South Korea, Japan, other countries that have stated their ambition to become uh, carbon neutral until 2050. And uh, we're already seeing today that uh, the EU is, uh, is uh, including shipping or, or intending to include shipping in their uh, ETS system, right? So uh, in general, it, it seems like uh, market-based measures will be the, the, the way to go forward. That basically means uh, levies and taxes, and uh, uh, that can be also in a combination, uh, like a, a fee-based system. Uh, emission trading systems and the subsidies. So basically market-based me uh, measurements that complement uh, other sorts of, uh, of measurements, of, of measures. Um, there is a very serious proposal actually uh, uh, in relation to, in, to implementing a carbon levy of uh, around 250 to $300 per metric ton of CO2 in order to close this gap. So it's quite significant amount. And uh, that would go to the, with, together with the introduction of a self-financing uh, fee-based system, which is basically uh, levies charged on those that are emitting above a certain threshold of CO2 emission. And on the other hand, those same uh, funds being used as subsidies for those who are uh, emitting below that, uh, that threshold. And together with the using part of those funds also in uh, research and development and the support of the, of the smaller island economies, as it was also stated here before. But uh, in itself, this matter will also give uh, room for a, a whole seminar and, uh, to speak about this. So, I mean, I would like to, to leave it there and probably Tristan and others will have a, a also a good contribution and a, a better answer to, to, to that particular question. Thank you. And yes, you're right. We could spend the whole morning uh, talking about some of these, if not a whole week. Um, um, Tristan, um, a recent analysis for the Getting to Zero Coalition estimates that uh, zero carbon bunker fuels will need to represent at least 5% of the shipping uh, fuel mix by 2030 um, to reach the uh, IMO's climate target for 2050. So could you please tell us, um, in your view, which segments of the industry may contribute to reaching this, uh, this really critical threshold? Yes, we've, we've just made a, a very quick initial analysis and we're trying to test this a bit more as a concept, but we thought that maybe the sectors that are most, uh, that are closest to the clients and the customers who have the end user requirement to be decarbonized, and that's basically the rich consumers, so the consumers in North America, the consumers in Europe, who, who have got the potential to express that preference and pay a slightly higher price for goods, albeit a very, very small increase in price, and because of the brands that are associated with that. And we can already see that happening. So we can already see the Ikeas and the Walmarts and Amazon and um, Apple all making noises about wanting to decarbonize not just their operational emissions, but their supply chain emissions, the emissions associated with with producing and bringing the goods to the consumers. So it's a relatively simple step to then go from that to say, well, what about the shipping component of that, that activity? Um, surely that would be an early adopter. And I think the signs are that that's, that's playing out already, um, albeit at the moment, primarily with biofuels, which are the easy way to start in that space. But I'm hoping that we'll see that some of the big container lines driven by their customers will increasingly be, be talking about uh, more scalable zero carbon solutions. The other sector besides container, that I think is obvious are the, are the vessels that already move some of the future fuels around. So uh, ultranavs, uh, um, movement of ammonia could be that the vessels associated with that are the classical early adopters. They already have crews that understand that particular molecule and the safety risks, which are gonna be important to, to, to make sure that are managed. And, uh, and we can see that the people owning and operating those vessels have engine specifications which are quite aligned to very small modifications needed to enable to run them on ammonia. There are already many methanol tankers and that's a parrot, parroting of how we learned a lot about ironically LNG as a marine fuel because actually we move a lot of LNG in liquid form around the world and it was those LNG carriers that first started to adapt engines to run on their cargo that gave us the learnings that led to where we are now and why LNG is a credible candidate fuel even if it's not a good idea to use from a decarbonization perspective we got that experience because of the vessels that use it as a cargo and and we have the parallels for the zero carbon options and then the other the other case to make is actually that the the early adoption of these 
options is really about where you can spot the niche opportunity and that could actually be in almost any ship type so we've made generalizations like container fleets and lng or and sorry uh, ammonia tankers but but there are examples already appearing now of coal uh, sorry not coal carrying bulk carriers vessels that move bulk commodities which um, have spotted that they're in an industry which is vertically integrated uh, the Japanese example of Itosha is the one I most often use, where this is a company that has some business in the production of ammonia, some business in the movement of goods at sea, and some business in the, in the ownership and operation of ships, that has found a way to link all of those things together to make an early adoption business case. So I, I don't want to restrict any of this to any individual ship type. It's where, where the opportunity can be spotted and taken advantage of. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Tristan. Okay, well, thank you all um, very much for uh, for these really valuable insights, uh, in particular thinking it through it from the industry perspective, which is, I have to say, sometimes working in a place like the World Bank, we, we tend to, um, you know, lack that perspective. So really interesting to hear from you. Um, this brings us to uh, the end of our panel discussions, and I'd like to really open it up for question and answers. We have about mm, 15 minutes left before we, uh, we have the closing. Um, and I want to thank all of you who have already sent in questions. And, um, and also just to say that we have um, some experts responding to questions in real time in the comment section. So please um, keep sending them in. Um, in the meantime, the team has very handily, I have to admit, um, just selected a few of the questions that came um, through. So I'm going to just go through my um, notes here that they sent. Okay, so my the first question that I'd like to pose is for um, Secretary Durand. Um, Isabelle, I hope you're still with us. Um, like with any IMO initiative, the problem in developing countries is capacity to develop the relevant policies, implement and enforce them. I think this is where interventions will be required from UNCTAD or indeed the World Bank. How do you um, intend on doing that and, and what do you think um, the role, I guess, of UNCTAD or other organizations like UNCTAD or the World Bank um, is? So definitely, we have to uh, work together and to collaborate because UNCTAD is uh, an organization not with a big department on the maritime issue, but this small team, very efficient, uh, is also uh, permanently um, representing the developing countries' sensitivities, needs, um, capacity to, to digest all those new rules. And when you think, for instance, about what happened in the past uh, with renewable energy uh, and how many time we needed, even in developed countries, to really incentivize and promote uh, uh, renewable, renewable energy, it means that with new fuels, for instance, it requires a lot of capacity for the countries to digest and to understand the rules First of all, and to be part in the discussion. It's why UNCTAD is collaborating with uh, IMO, with World Bank and others, with all, with this specific sensitivity for developing countries and, and, and in particular, the most vulnerable in the developing countries. We offer toolkits, we offer, as I said, port management uh, program, etc. Statistics and data are very important because otherwise it's a little bit like that. Yes, I will, I don't will, or it's just political commitment. It's not enough, we need data. And it's why the, the data that we, that we could provide on maritime country profile, it's useful for the Minister of Transport, but also for other stakeholders, for private sector, for, for NGOs working in de decarbonization advocacy. So I think that that's we can provide. We are not the only one. We are part, part, uh, part of, of the system, but we will try to use all our tools in order to feed also the IMO discussion, uh, because it's there that decision has to be taken and having in mind that we are not on the same level. Sorry, but uh, a lot of country, I see that also in all the, the work we are doing on digital economy. It's the same, it's a, it's a new economy driving force and a lot of countries has to be assisted in order to understand and to look how they could take benefit of and not only 
just to be passively uh, uh, um, uh, witnessing the evolution. So yes, we will do our best with the, and collaborating with all the partners also, of course, with the private sector. It's why we, I'm here today. Also with the, 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 the all the fishing, uh, the, 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 yes, the fishing, but also the maritime sector in order to really provide this, uh, uh, this part of the, the, this angle of the developing countries. So that's what we will continue to do. And I'm really happy to collaborate with all of you uh, and my team, especially dedicated to that. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, um, Isabel. Okay, I have a question here for, for Tristan. Um, Tristan, proposing hydrogen and ammonia as fuels for shipping instead of LNG can also be interpreted as doing nothing to reduce emissions for the next decade or so. So how would you respond to that? Um, it's a good question, and this is the dilemma that often ties us all in knots. And my first point is really this is shipping's carbon emissions are not just driven by the fuel it consumes. Uh, there are a myriad improvements that we can make to ships and the way we operate them and what we move from a global supply chain perspective that reduce CO2 and do not require us to make any judgment on the fuel used. And the most important aspect of that, which is continuously ignored, is the use of wind assistance um, as a technology. And this can be fitted to all ships without worrying about whether they're using LNG or heavy fuel oil or marine diesel oil. Um, it's got a greater saving potential on certain types of ships. So it's true that on container vessels, for example, which have a lot of containers on their deck and make it difficult to have large masts and sails, uh, it's not a natural fit, but there are still technologies like kites, which can and have been used successfully to save fuel. Uh, on many other ships, there are claims of numbers 10, 20, 30% greenhouse gas reductions that would be achieved immediately, uh, that would be achieved this decade, and that would then carry on being fuel savings that would make that ship use less of the more expensive future fuels that we'll need in the future. So if we're going to do anything this decade, because we don't believe that the hydrogen ammonia will be available, then focus on technologies that improve the energy efficiency and operational interventions. And fortunately, the IMO is starting to put a regulatory framework to help drive those, because we know the shipping industry has significant market barriers and failures preventing their adoption historically, which is why they remain options on the table. We know, and the IMO itself has released a recent report saying there's loads of scope in the interface between ships and ports and how we can avoid the kind of hurry up and wait behavior that we often have in ships. Um, and that interface gets improved through digitalization, a theme that was in the IMO Future of Shipping discussion this morning, uh, uh, hosted by Singapore. So there's, there's loads of things in that space where we could be putting our energy rather than having the argument about LNG, which is so often taking the taking the um, bandwidth or the, or, the, or the discussion. But I'd like to end just with a point that this isn't a decadal uh, distance away. Hydrogen ammonia spec ships are ordered today and the machinery manufacturers are saying they will be ready by the middle of the decade the point that we don't have at this stage is a very solid business case for someone to run a fuel which could be two or three times more expensive than the fossil fuel equivalent um, and the the policy need is to bridge that we have five years to do that surely that isn't impossible so the only thing that is preventing um, a significant and then growing portion of the fleet running on a zero carbon fuel from 2025 onwards is just political will. And I think, again, I'm going to go back to Biden because I think his statement is is extraordinary. You know, a presidential level statement about driving IMO to 100% zero by 2050 pushes everything back another five, 10 years in terms of when you need to start, when you actually need to be managing a transition that we know isn't going to happen overnight. It's going to follow the same S-curve shape of transition that all transitions follow, which means by 2030, we need to be most of the way there uh, to be able to then scale very rapidly as we go into the 2030s and get anywhere close to that number. So um, let's stop talking about these as being a decade away. They are five years away and then factor that into the way we use our language. Thanks, thanks, Tristan. Um, and then the next question actually builds on some of the things that Tristan just um, um, uh, referred to. So, and this one is for Birgitte and, and Christian. Um, how about using Industry 4.0 technologies for decarbonizing maritime transport, such as using blockchain, 
um, Internet of Things, artificial attendance. So I don't know who wants to go first. Would be interesting to hear your views on that from your perspective. I, I guess I can start with a, a few reflections. Uh, I don't think there is an engine for blockchains yet, but uh, I think Tristan uh, did a lot of, of the, the comments around fuel efficiency, optimization, etc., where clearly there are opportunities with technology. Um, the other point, which maybe is related to blockchain, or we are looking also at certificates, is let's say uh, you fuel your engine with ammonia and you have uh, gray ammonia produced by gas, uh, fossil ammonia, and then you have green ammonia produced with renewable energy. Um, in the power market, we have a certificate system with a certificate guarantee of origin, which can sort of be used to demonstrate that your fuel is really green, while the actual electricity is a mixture of green and gray because you can't split it out. And I think you would think something around the same lines here, but because you can't have one logistical chain for gray ammonia and another logistical chain for green and split it because that would be just too um, complicated and not very efficient. And then you can then use either certificates or blockchain or another technology to demonstrate uh, that origin in a way. But um, that's some reflections from me. Yeah, well, not a lot to add uh, to that. Just the, the fact that maybe in terms of digitalization on board ships, uh, there is a, a relevant role that, uh, that is played by all the sensors and uh, the information that is managed uh, on board, which can lead to improvements in, in energy efficiency on, on board. Uh, we are we are implementing a program of uh, auto logging sensors uh, on on board uh, of all of our ships, and we believe that uh, managing that data precisely with uh, with uh, trustworthy information can lead you to much better decisions in terms of uh, energy efficiency. And, and just a reflection, also adding to what uh, Tristan was saying in terms of the the transition to to carbon fuels. I think one of the interesting angles is the, the fact that uh, today the development in technology is, uh, is also pointing towards retrofitting current engines with the option of burning, for example, the uh, ammonia and, uh, and green ammonia, basically. So that will play, I think, an important role in, in uh, accelerating the, the transition of, of, uh, of uh, propulsions to uh, fuels that are uh, carbon neutral. We don't have to wait uh, for a full decade, as uh, Tristan says. Thanks, thanks, uh, Brigitte and Christian. Um, I have a question here, which, which I actually thought was kind of interesting, and I don't know um, who would like to answer it. And, and I'm actually even inviting Andrew or Dominic if they, if they feel uh, they have the answer. But we've talked a lot about you know, policymakers, um, shipping companies, investors today. But, but what about individual customers or consumers? So you know, someone like me, um, what can I do um, to support shipping's energy transition you know, as I order my things on Amazon, uh, et cetera. So it'd be really interesting to hear any, any thoughts on that. And again, I don't know who feels they have the answer to that. I think maybe I can come in here, um, Bernice. It's, it's a very good question. I think it's, um, it's something that affects and concerns um, all of us. So what can we do? Um, uh, Tristan has already um, uh, alluded to this and others have so too. There's a big role that charterers play in this game. So kind of the companies that move goods around the world and these companies are profit making uh, companies, profit maximizing companies, of course, but what they are really care about is their customers. And if their customers come to them and ask them, is this furniture, is this laptop, is um, uh, this book here, has it been shipped carbon free to my place? I want to get such a service um, uh, um, uh, as a, uh, I want to get a, such a service and I'm willing to pay a premium for this. These charterers are gonna go to um, um, uh, the ship owners who are gonna go to the ship builders and are gonna tell them, our customers, our clients want the service, make sure that we can deliver the service. So each of us, of course, we have only an incremental um, um, 
influence here. But if we really let them know that we want carbon-free goods to be delivered to our um, uh, doorstep, this is going to make a difference in the industry. And therefore, I encourage everybody here, given that 80% of the goods transported around the world have been carried by ships, to make this request and ask for a green delivery. Thanks, Dominic. Okay, Tristan, you said you also had some thoughts on this. We have um, about a minute left before we need to go to our closing. So very quickly, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, very quickly, be intelligent and be discriminating and maybe a bit cynical because, you know, whilst we, we're at the early stages of this movement of consumers being really empowered with knowledge as to where they should buy things, but most of the claims at the moment that we're aware of are pretty dubious. So they're companies that are either expecting to use offsets or like to talk about net zero targets in a sector which really doesn't have any, any negative emissions and so it's only real pathway is zero. And so... Um, be very careful and check the detail rather than just jumping on something that says green, make sure it's genuinely green and hopefully in the meantime we'll, we'll accelerate to get more meaningful definitions used more rigorously than they are at the moment. Yeah, thanks, thanks Tristan. That's of course um, <laughs> very true for many of the things we're doing um, in the climate space. Um, yeah. Okay, so we've come to the end of our, um, our panel discussions. We've had some really interesting questions and answers. So I really want to thank everyone for, um, well, first of all, the panelists for participating. And of course, also really thank our audience for, uh, for sending in some really excellent questions. Um, let me now come to the last part of today's um, event and invite Ms. Uh, Johanna Christensen to share closing remarks with us. Ms. Uh, Ms. Christensen is the Managing Director at the Global Maritime Forum and will reflect a little bit on the discussion from the perspective of the, uh, of the getting, getting to Zero Coalition. So over to you, uh, Johanna. Uh, thank you so much, Bernice. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, first of all. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the chance to, to join this session, which I think has been really excellent. And, and especially for your last question, which it seemed a little bit like it stopped the panel. <laughs> and so it's always good to, to ask the difficult questions, even to such an esteemed panel. So that's, that was great. Um, but I think more importantly, for the support that you and your colleagues at the World Bank are, are, are providing in this in this transition, in shipping's energy transition. Um, you're making such an important contribution in terms of developing new knowledge that can inform decision makers um, already. And I think it was, um, I think it was Birgitta who made the point, there's so much uncertainty in such a, tra a transition and, and you're playing a really important role in, in helping inform decision makers. And, and I hope we'll continue to do so because it's a, it's a really important role. Um, in connecting stakeholders, I think there are a lot of, um, Shipping exists a little bit in its in its own little bubble, and and it and it's sometimes underappreciated that all the different stakeholders that need to work together in order to make this transition happen. Um, just now we spoke about consumers or the consumer facing companies, um, policymakers from all sorts of different spheres. I think Nigel mentioned it at the beginning that we need to link uh, even policies uh, policymakers within. Um, within countries with each, each, each other to, to understand how, how to make this transition in shipping happen. Um, so, so your ability to bring stakeholders to the table that might not otherwise necessarily find each other inside the shipping bubble. Um, and then of course, also through the tremendous um, influence, I should say, that you have as, a, as an important in institution globally um, in informing other policymakers, but also with your own uh, evolving policy landscape, as that you can implement um, in your own in your own activities. So, so I think that's a that's a really important role that you play, and I hope you will continue to make it uh, make it felt in the sector. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I think the other great thing about the session was that so often in shipping we focus on the challenges. And especially with regards to shipping's decarbonization, we're focused so much on the hurdles. And I recognize that there are many, but this it was really great with this report also to articulate some of the opportunities that exist. Um, opportunities to honestly, to democratize the global energy landscape in a whole new way, um, to unlock investment to a whole new range of countries. Um, uh, and to have them join in as, as providers of, of, of fuels, of energy for this sector, a source of energy for this sector in the future. And I hope that this 
can play a, a piece in, in connecting some of the stakeholders that need to work together to, to realize that potential. Um, so from, so as, uh, yeah, well, my role is twofold. So first of all, representing the Global Maritime Forum, but also in particular, the Getting to Zero Coalition, um, which is a, a, a group, a coalition of an alliance of, of 140 plus uh, stakeholders from across the shipping and energy value chains that are working together to uh, decarbonize shipping. Um, a decarbonizing shipping can sound like a big goal, but I think really one of the things that I've, I've seen in, in, in the coalition that is uh, that is that's so exciting uh, is that there's this genuine desire to move uh, uh, away from only talking about the sort of the long-term goals and long-term ambitions, which are incredibly important, to focusing on short-term actions. And so the sort of the the ambition of the coalition that is that is that has formed over these over these past years that is since its launch in 2019 is really to make zero emission ships or zero emission shipping uh, the dominant choice by 2030 at the latest and i think the dominant and competitive choice i might add since so much of our conversation here today has been about competitiveness uh, uh, of zero emission shipping and what is required to achieve that competitiveness some hurdles obviously need to over, be overcome and, and several of the panelists have touched upon some of these hurdles, be that uh, conducive policy environment, be that collaboration across the value chain, et cetera. But I, I think really what we're seeing in the Getting to Zero Coalition is that there's a, a genuine desire and a real ambition and, and a willingness to work together with you know, existing stakeholders, but new stakeholders and, the, and, and, and you're playing a really important role in making that happen. And so, that's thing that, that I hope we can take away from this discussion today. Um, I think another point that I, I just wanted to raise in closing was this sort of idea of, again, it's the short and the long, is uh, Tristan, you articulated it so well here at the end, is that so much needs to happen now and in the immediate future. And we can see some of that happen. So in the context of getting to Zero Coalition, we've done a mapping of pilots and demonstrations. It's an, it's an imperfect mapping. <laughs> it's, it's done by a small team that basically just scours the internet and try, tries to, 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 to find all, all the projects that are already underway. But what we can see, even we've done this twice now, even in six months, we've seen a, a huge rise, uh, an almost doubling of the amount of projects that we were able to find, but also a maturing and, and scaling up of the projects. So I think what we've seen, uh, even in a short amount of time, is, is that that we're con continuously, ambition is ramping up, um, um, scale is ramping up, desire to move further and faster is happening ever, ever more so. And I think even more so in the past few days as we've seen great new statements come out um, uh, at, at the political summit in, in the US. So, so that, that's, that's just a really exciting time. And I think it bodes well for ability to realize, uh, realize this transition. I, I, I only want to just quote at the very end, uh, um, since we are speaking here in, in the context of, of Singapore's um, event, uh, Singapore Maritime Week, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the chief executive of the Maritime Port Authority uh, in Singapore, uh, Kuala Hoon, she said er earlier today, and I think it's such a great way to leave us on, is that we need to go far, we need to go fast, and we need to go together. And so I think, I hope that's what, what everyone takes away from this session here today. Thank you, Johanna. I think uh, that's a perfect quote to end with indeed. So, um... So again, I really want to thank everyone uh, for joining us this morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, especially our panelists. I've, I've personally thought it was a really great discussion and, and I've learned a lot about a topic that I actually am pretty ignorant about. I mean, the team has been working hard at educating me, but um, I recognize I'm still very much um, you know, a lay person as, as it comes to this topic. So um, great discussion. Um, we really hope that all of you will stay tuned in the weeks and months ahead as we um, as we uh, push forward on this work, not just in the World Bank, of course, but, but all of our partners um, that are here today and, and, and others. Um, and, and I think as, as, um, as has been mentioned uh, a few times this morning, you know, these are, you know, it's an exciting time and really it's a, this is a crucial agenda um, as part of this, uh, you know, increasing our ambition on climate. Um, the World Bank is, uh, is about to launch its own new climate change action plan, but of course we're hearing a lot from, uh, from uh, you know, encouraging news, whether it's from the US or um, other parts of the world. So 
Um, with that, thanks again, everyone, for joining us today and um, very much hope you have a great uh, rest of the day. Thank you.